our summer classes and our fall enrollment, um, these things became really evident to us that um, it's going to be very difficult for me to be back in the classroom. If I'm teaching microbiology and um, part of my lab responsibilities are to um, help students um, focus their microscope or um, work in close groups together, um, if you're teaching anatomy and everyone has to sort of be around one model, um, this just is not going to be a safe environment for me or the students. And so I just, uh, you know, from that perspective, I had to really rethink what I was doing. Um, we do have some people, what the college did then was um, say that the, the full-time instructors uh, could sort of decide how things were going to go in the fall. Um, for the people who teach in the health careers, prereqs, microbiology, chemistry, Chem 100, Bio 110, Bio 210, those classes will be completely online for the next year. I have uh, three instructors that will, and, and let me just back up, all of the science instruction will be, the, the lectures will be given online. Um, I have three instructors who will be using um, a hybrid approach where their lectures will be online, but they will be giving in-person, face-to-face labs. Um, the rules for doing that, um, the labs have to be um, delivered in September and October. We have to be finished with the labs and out of the building by the 1st of November. And so that means that for those people who are making that choice, they have to deliver two labs a week, two labs a week for the 15 weeks uh, to get that all into the eight week window that they're gonna be offered. And the only 12 students can be in the lab at one time. So all this to say that um, this makes it pretty messy to offer lab sections for the, the um, hundreds of lab sections of science classes we have. For the three, the three instructors who are doing this, um, this is going to be really uh, hectic and difficult for us to navigate. It will take two labs and the entire day to get people scheduled for these classes. Um, so, and then finally, um, I think the, um, the deep cleaning that's going to be required in between lab sections, at this time, that seems to be falling to those instructors. And so they'll have to be figuring that piece out. So, so why are we doing simulations? Well, for all of these reasons, um, most of us have elected to go to online teaching because we can't possibly anticipate um, the environment um, as, as we move forward. Does, does that make sense? Does that give you a sense of why, um, you know, this dramatic shift in how we're, we're delivering science courses? Any questions on that? No, it makes a lot of sense to me. So um, I've had to I've had to think a lot um, about um, I, I need to give myself some grace. I need to understand that I there's nothing I can do that's going to take the place of the face to face lab experience. Right? We uh, we're formed. You know, we cut our teeth on this lab experience. It's our bread and butter. Um, and um, as I think through what students get from the face to face lab experience. I think it's a significant. I, I can't replace the manual dexterity, for instance, that someone's going to get from handling an inoculating loop and a, a test tube and um, doing titrations. I can't replace that. Um, I can replace the problem solving. I can figure out the group work, the group work. Um, I, can, I can figure out the hypothesis testing a little bit. Um, I think it's going to be really, really hard for me to um, reinforce lab hygiene practices. I was notorious in um, delivering microbiology labs for calling out people who, um, who touched their face or who didn't have a good technique. These, the women in this um, picture here, uh, they would never be allowed to stay in my lab, right? They'd have to go put their hair up and get lab coats on and and we would really think through, deeply think through um, the lab practices. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to reinforce that. And, um, but I will be able to reinforce some lecture topics. So I think there are some things that I'm gonna give up 
but there's some things I'm going to gain as well. Uh, and I don't know if anyone has had that reflection or if there are things, other things that you would add to this list. Hey, Chris. Sorry, I'm just seeing new people adding, uh, coming online here. So if there are things that you would add to this list, please, um, please chime in. Um, I do think as I, as I looked at the list of things I think people get from the labs, um, I think we didn't do a really good job uh, sometimes of making these things standard and uniform and thinking about um, how we would assess them and really sort of embracing them in some ways, right? We all just sort of assumed that this is what we were doing. Uh, but when I'm faced with the dilemma of offering this um, um, alternate experience in the lab, I think about these things, um, the things that I'm going to have to give up and, and think about how I'm going to sort of reconnect students to the lab experience through some other means. So, so basically what it's meant for me is that um, I really have to think about um, what were my outcomes? What was I trying to get at in the laboratory? And um, knowing that I'm going to give up some stuff, how do I, how do I get to some other things, right? So I had to get to some, I'm going to call it out of the box thinking. There are some things that um, students are just not going to get and I've got to be giving myself grace um, and not obsessing about those pieces. Um, this is what I can do. And in doing this, my students, our students are going to go on with their lives. They're not going to be stuck in 2020. Um, they're going to get to go on to nursing school and dental hygiene programs and and they're going to get to achieve their goals. But if I, if, I, if I stop this process and I say, oh, we can't do microbiology without some hands-on lab stuff, um, I, students are, are not going to get what they want. So, um, so I, can't, I can't provide the simulations. I can't do the lab manual dexterity. Um, I can't cultivate lab hands. Um, but I can find some simulations that I think um, are going to reinforce lecture concepts and do a really good job of it. Um, and, and some of the things that I found that I think work really well. Um, one, has anybody wor worked with Labster? No. So Labster is a, a software package that is, uh, that the college has purchased. It's integrated into Canvas. If you, um, and I'm gonna have David chime in here in just a second or Molly. Um, if you use Labster, they send you the cartridge, you download it to Labster, I'm oh, sorry, you download it to Canvas, and um, just like a, making an assignment, you go into assignments and you find the simulations, preview them, and assign them to the students. David, could I have you chime in here, or Molly, and talk a little bit about the process of integrating into Canvas? Molly has the Labster experience, so I will let her uh, handle this. I'm going to... Um, great question. And uh, I made a... I knew I was going to forget how it works because everything integrates a little bit differently, but there is a video that I made that uh, walks you through the process of integrating with Labster. Um, so if you'd, if you'd like me to take that time, Cynthia, I'd be happy to pull up that video and screen share it. Um, um, so or we can do that at the end if there's time or... Okay, let's, let's plan to do that. I've opened up my um, Canvas course that I'm teaching this summer. And um, I was just going to show that if you just click on the assignments after you get it, after you get the uh, cartridge from Molly. Okay, so there might be a few of them. Here are all the simulations, right? So I can just click on the simulation and um, you can see that I can um, add it to my Canvas course, just like I would add any other, um, any other assignment. And you can say edit the assignment and um, I can make it do um, whenever I want to. I can add it for points. Um, those, so those are some things to to sort of arm wrestle with how you want it to integrate into your course that way. Um, but it, it's just as easy as that. And then um, put it into my modules. Um, and then you to run the simulations, you just click the, the window and it will launch, right? The launching for, for Labster takes a little bit of time. Um, but, and once you're in it, it's very, um, I'm, 
gonna think like um like game uh gaming right like so i'm this is not my culture so i'm walking in a different world now but now i've got headsets on and i feel like i'm um yeah i'm just like playing um warcraft or something like that so <laughs> sorry <laughs> so that's the um the simulation the lobster simulation um Chris, you've had some experience with this, so I'm going to just encourage you to jump in if you get if you think about it. If you got anything you'd add? Okay. Um, I don't think I'm going to wait for the. Um, hey, Cynthia, for if you want me to go through that process now, folks, you want to see that process of of downloading the cartridge, real quick. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll do a share. Quick... I'm going to stop my share. All right, hey folks. Uh, let's see, let's do a screen share. And let me grab the... video that I made. So that I don't forget a step. So basically, let me... Okay, so basically you end up in a, you have a new course, it's empty. Um, you're going to have to import your course content. Now, there used to be a big old add existing content button down here at the bottom. Uh, that's no longer the case. There's no sound on this video, so you're not missing anything. I'm just going to talk through it. Um, uh, now, what you would do is you would go, to, go down to settings and then import course content. It's the exact same process that you would follow if you have ever copied a Canvas course. We're going to end up in the same spot. Um, so then I'm going to select the content type. And normally if I was copying a Canvas course, I'd pick that first one, but instead I'm gonna pick a common cartridge 1.x package. Common cartridge is just a fancy term that means this will work in different learning management systems. And so I'm gonna choose a file and this is where on my computer, I'm gonna find the file that I was given um, that cartridge file, it looks like a bunch of gibberish potentially uh, when it was on my computer. And then I'm gonna say I want all content and I'm gonna hit import. And then that's gonna run, it might take a little while. I kind of sped through it for the video. Um, and then the important step is you have to go to settings and at least when I installed this for Cynthia, when I um, was talking to the rep, you had to go into settings and then apps and it created a duplicate app for some reason. It's just a bug that they haven't fixed. Um, no worries, it's just an extra step. You go into app configurations and again, we'll send you this video so that you don't have to you know, miss a step. Um, and basically you just wanna find the one that lets you delete it called dashboard. There's a Labster dashboard and there's a just a plain dashboard and that the just plain dashboard is extra. So we're going to delete that. And doing that will allow them to not clash with one another and the Labster dashboard that was installed in Canvas will be allowed to work. And so then if you go to your assignments tab, um, you're going to find all of those Labster assignments. Now this might take a while to load too but you have all of these Labster assignments and you just get access to everything and you are welcome to assign only those things that are relevant to your class. And so what I would do is I would hit the button to double check to make sure that Labster is working. And if it launches, just like we saw before, then you know that you have successfully um, integrated your Canvas course with Labster. And that's it, folks. Molly, Molly, I have a quick question. Yeah. That might be appropriate time. So in putting them in your assignment page, then they appear in your gradebook. So when you go to grade, you have 260 items in that gradebook that are unpublished as long as you don't publish it. But you as an instructor are looking the, at them and had to browse through columns and columns and columns and columns of unpublished assignments to look at what your gradebook looks like. Is there a way to at least hide those columns in your gradebook so you don't have to swim through them? Um, you could potentially, I think, delete the simulations or you could, um, uh, filter your gradebook based on, um, assignment group or based on module. 
Um, I am. I will probably let Cynthia speak to how to manage a, a Canvas Labster gradebook, um, since she would have more more practical advice. Probably at this point. I wish I. I wish I did, Molly. I've been trying to work. <laughs> <laughs> trying to work on that one. It has been um, it's been a little bit of a frustration, and I haven't found a great way to do this yet. Um, other than, like Molly said, um, you know, just selecting um, the assignment groups. Um, but I can't I can't seem to get rid of all of those um, those Labster simulation columns. And are the simulations are they all published? Uh, no, so um, I'm I'm going to take over screen sharing from Molly, and sh I can um, I guess I could I think I can show you this. The gradebook has an option to um, hide any unpublished assignments. Oh, so how do you do that? Let me go to a gradebook that um, doesn't have people in it. I thought too when I because I'm using Labster for the Chem 100 that I thought I could select which ones to import. So I only had imported like 40 or something that I thought were good. And then I went through and deleted a bunch. So I only have a handful left. So I thought there was some selection method that I was able to do. Yeah, Chris, if you could share how you select, pre-select before you import, that would be great. Yeah. I, maybe I'm setting up a master right now, so I'll see if it forces me to redo that and see. But I know I did not have 200 in there. I only had the ones I selected from some kind of drop down. Um, and maybe there was just a little button in there that I clicked that gave me those options as my desk. You can, you can choose to import uh, all content or yeah. only some content and so that is a that's a radio button that you check um yeah. we'll stick a link to the canvas article that tells you how to import just some content yeah because when i did that then i could just select the ones that were clearly chemistry like that i had already previewed on their site and then um once it was in canvas then i could go through and say there were two on acid bases then i deleted the one i didn't want so I, I still have a handful that I'm still debating on that are there, but I don't have 200 because, wow, that sounds painful too. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. That would be really helpful, I think. Um, I don't know, David, do you want to um, just, here's the grade book, um, a class that I don't have students in. Um, what's the, where's the filter for getting rid of like unpublished? I think it's in the view options. Yeah, so it's checked right now, so. Oh, just uncheck it? Mm, no, it should be checked to not view unpublished assignments. Anything that shows up when that's checked should only be published materials. Okay, so when it's checked, it shows up if you uncheck it. Oh, right, okay. yep, I reversed okay. that. Okay, so. Hopefully, Laura, that answers our question there. That we'll help? have to play with it a little bit and, and maybe I'll, I'll shoot um, some emails, see if we can yeah. get it to a point where we don't have to see those. I have it here open because I, and we have all those unpublished columns there. Um, it was really, so the first go around, I downloaded everything um, it turns out I was um, I was surprised that um, I would have interest in some of the simulations that weren't just microbiology. I needed some of the chemistry stuff, um, and then I was just interested in like the anatomy and some of the physiology stuff. Um, for me, that was a great way to maybe connect. And I have a lot of students who are taking physiology or or um, A and P right now, and so um, sometimes I would just open those simulations so they could see them. Um, and, and maybe connect some of the microbiology to what they were doing in their, their AMP or, or um, human phys classes. So that was kind of fun, but um, my grade book is kind of a mess right now. Um, yeah, so this Labster simulation software is, um, it's really expensive and it's, I think, a pretty powerful tool. And um, I'll encourage people to use that. I know that the A and P people are using ADI, ADI-LT. Um, and again, um, uh, simulation software 
that um, has been pretty successful in, in doing the kinds of things we do in, in the laboratory. And Sharissa, you guys are using um, Verner or Ver Vernier? Um, I'm choosing to use Pivot Interactives by Vernier. Um, it's real live experiments that students observe, collect data on, have to decide what data to collect, and then they make predictions. They lock in their predictions and find out if they are right or wrong by seeing a video um, of what actually happens later, and then they can make new predictions. Um, only $10 per student. Um, I'm not sure if it would be as useful for biology as it is for chemistry and physics, but I just want to throw that out there. So maybe in the um, chat window, or maybe you could email me and, and David or David could send this out to everyone, the um, website, because that looks like a really great, and I think the, the other thing for me in, in considering this simulations has been networking with people and finding different simulation um, sites and using different things and just trying some things out. Um, but uh, I would say Labster, ADI, ADI is good, and then this um, um, uh, Werner that uh, Sharissa's mentioning. Those things can be really helpful. If you find other sites, the, the nice thing about the Labster and I think ADI is that the college is paying for those, so there's no additional cost to the student. Um, they're not paying for uh, Werner, and so that one is, um, but only $10 to the student. So we're trying really hard to make sure that we've got um, um, product in place, but also not, not adding too much to the students in terms of um, cost. Um, so I, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the successful things that I've had um, in this last um, semester, this last term. I've only done this one time. So uh, again, I'm inviting you all to please chime in. Um, again, the Labster simulations, I think, have been um, pretty successful. To write up the lab experience, though, to rewrite my the lab directions, um, I had to walk through the, the um, simulation and have a second computer um, and be writing the directions for what I wanted the students to do and get out of it. Um, so that was a little bit time consuming. So I would, I would plan that on the up, um, on the upfront. Um, and I would consider getting students to do the simulations together. And again, Sharissa as or Chris chime in here, but um, the Labster things, you can't go in together, but if you're um, maybe like on the phone together, you could kind of, or on email or chat together, you could walk people through um, some things because there are some glitchy moments in the software packages and, and I've used ADI and the Labster simulations. There's some glitchy moments and I didn't know what to do. I wasn't sure what they were asking me to do, what I was supposed to click on. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways to get the students to do this together a little bit more. Um, again, Labster does not have um, a, a team approach to it. They're thinking about that as a future thing, but they don't have it currently. Um, you have to decide if you want the simulations to count for points. Um, and again, you walk through those simulations and decide like um, if it all is applicable to your course or if you're going to um, change your change your outcomes maybe um, and then I already talked about simulations being integrated into canvas um, so uh, another strategy so the simulations are great um, I've enjoyed using them they've really enforced what I, I talk about in lecture um, you know so I, I want to put a plug in for that I do have some some um, faculty who are using synchronous meetings in Zoom to deliver online labs. And so they're doing pretty much what they did face-to-face. -face. Um, they have all of the students come to the Zoom meeting, so synchronous, um, and then um, they split people out into um, uh, groups, into rooms, and get folks to uh, do an exercise. Um, you know, give them an exercise that they talk about together as one group and then split them out into meeting rooms uh, and then have the students come back together and, and report out. Um, this has been very successful for these instructors. 
Um, I would say from the student perspective, um, when we're taking online courses, it ha the number one complaint that comes to me because I'm the chair is that they, the students can't get to those meetings, even though it's says in the schedule that they're supposed to be available for those times, um, you know, something is always coming up. So this, um, at the risk of having things sort of snowball, I would say that the synchronous meetings have been very, very successful, but it is a burden on students um, when they're sort of setting their minds for taking online classes. Um, I also had people very successful in, I, I would call these talking tours. So they're doing the same labs they would do face to face. Um, they use Camtasia or Zoom and they record themselves giving directions and they say, okay, now I'm going to stop and, and you go and do these things, right? Um, and so they sort of build in some breaks and then um, they continue with the um, Canvas or the Zoom recorded message and they delivered the labs in that way. Um, and that's been pretty successful for uh, a couple of people as well. Whoops, and then I wanted to tell you that I did set up my lab practical on, um, um, uh, based on all of the simulations that the students have done this semester, uh, based on all of the labs and the feedback that they've received from me, um, I did set up a lab practical this semester. And um, so I, I stuck that in this presentation so you could see what it looks like. But essentially, I used um, groups in Canvas to email them um, a data set. It's different for every student. Well, there's probably 12 different data sets. So maybe two students have the same data set. Um, and I emailed them a set of, of media, a set of stains, and um, a set of data regarding um, colonies on plates. And um, again, this is all based on previous exercises that they've had, and now they have to analyze the data. And that's what they're doing for their lab practical. Anybody might chime in? Questions? Suggestions? I have a question about Babster. Are you giving yep. unlimited attempts, one attempt, somewhere in between for the? So uh, I, I'm not grading the simulations. I have questions in lab reports that they have to complete okay. um, that are based on the simulation questions and the concepts, but I didn't hold them um, accountable for each point in the simulation. Okay. Okay. Did you do that? I gave them two attempts to take it and then let their highest score. They also had, in addition to that simulation, I had them typically interact with a FET simulation and answer questions on that too. Um, you know, because I think my, my hardest part with the lab has been you know, when they're in the lab, they get feedback from you and their classmates and the whole point of the lab is a learning environment, right? And so this whole judge, judging them on the first time they answer the question, this is the first time they see it, um, I really struggled with. So I did give them the opportunity to take it two times. Um, plus there's a lot of places in there they can go and learn from, like read background and try again. But you know, I do wonder if that's artificially inflated their scores to be high. But then I also wonder, does that really matter? <laughs> like it's not a huge percentage and typically lab scores tend to be a little bit higher than their other scores. So, yeah, you know, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so. How long does one of these labs typically take? What did you say? How long do one of these labs typically take? Hi, about an hour. Yeah, it, and it varies on the students too. Um, how long? Sometimes I get stuck and I can't figure out. And you know, I was thinking about how um, the manual dexterity piece, uh, because a, a lot of what you're doing is clicking through. And if I showed you like the microbiology simulation, you'd have to remember to put on your lab coat and your gloves. You'd have to pick up the inoculating loop and you'd have to remember to sterilize it before you pick up the bacterial cultures. Um, so I think a lot about the, you know, it's telling you, leading you through the, you know, the, what you would do in the lab, um, but I don't have that manual dexterity piece. Um, but I, I thought the other day about how um, 
who would have anticipated that video games would teach us to have better pilots, right? That the dexterity you get from being a drone pilot, for instance, is transferable. So they're learning skills, it's a different skill set. Something but, too interesting is it one valuable skill you get in the lab is how to observe. You know, we're really talking about chemical reactions right now and evidence for chemical reactions occurring. And it hit me even going through these simulations, it's just not the same, but noticing the color change and, and et cetera. So, um, you know, like I always try to augment them with something else. So this time, instead of a FET simulation, I found a really cool video of just 10 really fun reactions and had them watch them and actually make observations you know, and classify what type of reaction they thought it was based upon the evidence, you know, and it's, yeah, it's trying to figure out what's missing that you think they normally would get and how do you figure out an alternative way to augment that has been a, a challenge, sometimes a fun challenge, sometimes a horrible challenge, but it's still a challenge. I've used a lot of YouTubes and um, I've tried to make a lot of YouTube, or not, not you, Camtasia. I've tried to make a lot of Camtasia videos, but I've used a lot of YouTube videos mm -hmm. that have been really helpful. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of areas of tension. Again, I don't want to um, walk away from any other questions that you're having, um, but I'm just throwing out ideas and things that I've thought about in the last, um, couple months as I've, I've moved the microbiology class to this um, space. Um, some areas of tension because I, as I talk to people, um, I have uh, a lot of people have different ideas about what it means to teach online and um, how we can deliver this. And so I'll get a lot of um, folks that say, well, I'll just have the students come and we'll just go for a walk in, in the woods here. We'll just go for this, we'll just take a tour of this forest and, and I can talk to them. Um, and so um, I would say that, um, you know, there's, there's some, some um, risk involved here. Um, and I'm always uh, thinking about sort of finding ways to minimize the risk to the college. They're pretty risk averse. Um, if we're trying to do chemistry, for instance, and we're saying, let's, let's send, um, let's have students get these chemicals and do this reaction at home, um, this is going to be a problem for us. We've We've had a couple of discussions in our department meetings about what is, what's, um, you know, what's okay. Uh, you know, can we have them put vinegar and baking soda together and, you know, feel comfortable with that? Um, you know, and so we're, we're really struggling with um, those kinds of things. The, the kits that you buy that are commercial kits, um, those companies have a liability um, insurance that goes with it, and they also have some sort of a waiver. Um, we, don't, we don't have that protection right now, and it's a, it feels a little uncomfortable. And I know that the college has been, um, anytime I've asked, they've come down in a very risk-averse reaction. Just don't do it, okay? So I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that that's been an issue. And and regarding getting people to travel to, um, to sites, um, again, the question is, are, you know, who monitors that for COVID behavior? Um, are students riding together? Um, did you get the, the release for the, the field trip thing signed? And how did you get all of those waivers back? So again, the issues, as I've asked them, as people have come up with ideas of doing things that are Beyond its simulations, um, the, 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 my administration, the, the person above me, is always responding with a sort of risk-averse um, response, right? Like, let's, let's find a different way to do this. So it's not that we can't, it's not that we, you know, that you can't do those things, but the, the go-to, the default here is to find something else. And, and again, if you've had experience, um, and there's something that you want to share with us, please, please chime in. Um, we have uh, a lot of people that want to just send the students to the store, you know, get the baking soda and the vinegar and do the experiment. Uh, again, you're asking students to go into environments that are, they may or may not feel comfortable in right now. But the other, the bigger thing is that 
Um, the, the things that the students purchase from the bookstore, their financial aid covers it. If we ask them to go to the grocery store, there's no financial aid coverage. And we don't know who's taking our classes when they're online. I might tell everybody to go to the Piggly Wiggly to pick up, you know, X, Y, and Z, but they don't live in a town where Piggly Wiggly exists, right? That's not their, their local store. So that could be a problem too. So those are some of the areas of tension that have bubbled up for me in the last, um, the last few weeks. I don't think I have anything else on this PowerPoint, so I'm gonna stop my screen share and see um, if there's anything else that, any other questions that um, have bubbled up as we've been talking. Maybe things that you've been successful at. Um, my A&P folks, um, you guys have some really great software, I think, that um, you're gonna be able to use for your simulations. Your full-time instructors are sort of setting, um, you know, setting that up now this summer so that you'll be ready to roll with it either summer two or fall. But anything else? Any other sites that you found that have been really helpful? What would be, is there anything that would be helpful in setting up um, or as you think about moving into this um, role of offering labs in um, a remote way, is there any kind of resource that would be helpful for you? Um, I know, you know, Chris and Sharissa um, have been great resources for me in terms of, you know, what they're using and, and how they're doing it. But um, like maybe just even uh, having a, a resource list of places that provide simulations or YouTube videos on a topic that you really liked, um, something like that. Um, any ideas on that one? Would they be helpful to you or, or is it just overwhelming right now? Um, I'm the newbie and haven't done this yet at all. So okay. when you're, you're, not, you're actually not the newbie, Kathy. I mean, quite well, honestly. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the uh, newbie, new, brand new class, brand new everything um, for, for my instruction this fall. So when you're talking about using Zoom and Camtasia, totally know nothing about it, trying to learn Canvas. So is there any kind of resource or tutorial that you can send out to me to help me so I don't have to weed through this forest totally alone trying to figure out the best way to do things because I've never used any of those for instruction. Yeah. Um, I'm going to leave David and Molly jump in here too, um, but um, I've been working with instructors to set up their Canvas course first. Um, and so once you get that set up, then tell me what you want to do and um, resources. I'm a good resource and I think others are on this page for uh, Camtasia and for, um, for Zoom. And David and Molly could, could be that person, those people as well. So okay. it, for me, it, it, it helps to be more just in time. Um, if I have to read through, read a lot, um, it gets overwhelming. So if I know what you want to do, I can point you in a direction for resources. Okay. You'll be Does my go-to person. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are other people that can be resources too, but yes, I would gladly do that. Kathy? Uh, yeah. This is David Cobb from the Faculty Success Center. Mm -hmm. um, we're a little less focused on the pedagogical side. I am more focused on the technical side. However, uh, we do have a lot of resources on how you can use the technology, um, Camtasia, Panopto, et cetera. Um, we don't necessarily tell you how to use it as an instructor um, from the pedagogical side, but we tell you technically this is how you use it so that once you decide how to best employ the tools for your class, you know how to use those tools. So I threw a link to the Faculty Success Center's YouTube channel in the chat, and I would recommend that you give that a look. We have uh, YouTube videos that we've created, as well as videos that we share from other individuals, um, either at KVCC or outside the institution, that cover a wide range of topics um, from Canvas and Moodle and Panopto and Camtasia and all sorts of things. Okay, that looks good. I'm um, pretty much delivering my lectures uh, using Panopto because it's integrated into Canvas and that's been the easiest. Um, but I like Camtasia a lot. 
Um, and because it's so much easier to edit, um, I use that for my talking tours when I'm talking people through how to do a lab, for instance. Um, I can open up the simulations. I can, oh yeah, I got a little glitchy part right here. You know, I can speed through things. Um, I really like Camtasia. Um, and so far, I, I think this is okay if I say this. Um, if I email uh, Lauren uh, or Elsa, if I email KBCCIT, um, they've been willing to download Camtasia onto our computers, our home computers. Um, and they, if you need software, if you, they, they've been willing to um, do that remotely. So you can also, um, and I don't know how this works, David or, or Molly, but you can also email Gail Fredericks and request a Zoom license so you can get the professional version of Zoom. Um, again, that helps in terms of how long your meeting times can go and um, just a little bit, it's a little bit easier to navigate the software. And we are right at this moment out of professional Zoom licenses. However, we do plan on obtaining uh, enough for any future faculty that need them. Uh, so we can't give it to you right now, but soon. Okay. I have been, go ahead. Sorry, Kathy. No, I'm just taking notes. <laughs> I have been um, using a, a camera that I got, um, an external uh, USB camera, um, so that I could have it focused on a piece of paper so I could take notes, write, draw notes um, as I'm lecturing. Um, and I found that um, students really like it when I can do that sort of animation, even though it's my drawing and I'm you know, horribly self-conscious about it. Um, they seem to really like that. Um, I have just ordered a doc cam. I understand that those um, are a little bit easier to use. This one that I have is, is all uh, rigged up on poles and on my dining room table, and it's kind of getting to be um, unruly. So I'm gonna try this doc cam and, and see if that works better. But the students do seem to like that a lot. And again, if I do that in Camtasia, I can edit out the how many ums I say in a five minute time. Could you send along uh, what USB camera you use and what doc cam you're gonna be trying? Sure. Let me, yeah, let me get it and, um, and give you some reviews on it. Okay, thanks. The one um, person I took a, a, a conference with, um, and I, I'm thinking about doing this as well. She used, she took the cam our cell phone cameras and she told students to put a piece of duct tape on the cell phone and, and, and tape it to a wall and then video yourself doing X, Y, and Z. So I'm thinking about having the students, um, I do this technique called isolation streak plate. I'm thinking about having them do it with um, icing on a cake um, with a, with a, a chopstick. <laughs> I don't know, I'm, it's an idea. So I'm, I'm work, I'll be working with my camera later today to see if that'll work. Yeah, so. Um, some of the, just a, just a, this is not about labs, although my lab practical is um, an assessment. Um, I've had to get pretty creative about assessments in this online format. Um, and so I'm just making sure that you're all aware that if you make tests, right, and you put them out there, um, we all have concerns about uh, who's taking the exams and all that sort of thing. And so most folks are using in Canvas a product called Respondus. It will lock down the student's browser. So you, you assign the test and when they log on to take the test, it locks down the browser so they can't go out and search websites. And then I use the function that um, has a monitor. So their camera is pointing at them. And if they um, take their gaze over here, um, I'll be able to see those kinds of things. And um, it's some, some measure of accountability, I guess. But we've had to get pretty creative with the um, assessment stuff. The testing lab is not available. You can't make up your exam and say, oh, I'll have the students go to the testing lab to take it. It won't, it won't happen.
lots of fun challenges. I've really enjoyed all the learning I'm doing. I've learned so much. I think the harder thing for me has been how, you know, like my lab time was my time to really deeply connect with students. And I don't have that anymore. I mean, like they show up to Zoom office hours and they don't even turn on their camera. So um, finding ways to really coach and mentor them um, when in the lab, that's what I would spend most of my time doing um, has been really a challenge. Um, the, this, the last couple of weeks, so the last three weeks, I'll just share this with you because I thought it, it's been kind of funny. Um, I decided that I had a whole bunch of people I kept emailing to come, please come to office hours or, you know, I'm concerned about your grade. I'm emailing it. They're like my pen pals. So a couple, maybe three weeks ago, I decided I'll just go through my class roster and I'll just start calling everybody. So I just, just started calling um, students, which has been just very fun. Um, I talked to a lot of moms because apparently when you sign up for community college, you put your mom's phone number down. So I did a lot of that. I would tell mom, you know, well, you know, you should have David call me. That would be great to talk to him. Um, so that's been pretty fun. But then some really, really good conversations about what the student wants to go into and how, the, how they're trying to balance um, taking this class and they've got a three-year-old and they have to go to work. And um, so I, it's been really helpful for me to get some good insights about the students. So, and I'm just, you know, I just kind of try to click off, you know, five calls a week, not something that's over overwhelming or taxing. So that's been a good, pretty good strategy. I don't see myself yeah. calling students, but, um, <laughs> but I've learned a lot through seeing my kids do Zoom meetings, especially my daughter. And I've signed her up for this thing called OutSchool Here, a little promo, free promo. They're not paying me for it, but that's really good if you have kids and you need to find something for them to do. Um, and so one thing, of course, is different to approach kids and teenagers and to approach adults. So I don't, I'm asking about you guys' opinion and what you see and what can work, but they throw out games, right? Like, I don't know, um, to truth and a lie or whatever. So they make everybody talk because, you know, the shy ones are always going to be the shy ones. And those are the hardest to get. Like in class, those, those were the ones that I could physically approach and make eye contact and in the lab, you can even go and, you know, I'm Latin American, I touch them. And whereas now it's so hard to get the ones that want to talk, they'll talk, but the ones that don't want to talk, those are the ones. So if you guys have had or have any ideas of uh, games that are appropriate with an adult group, that, that would be great and that have worked for you and that you can sort of mix game with teaching. So the um, conference that I um, attended, um, the a suggestion was to ask the students on their first meeting, because I get a lot of students who come to the Zoom conferences and they, they leave their, they're on mute and they don't put their pictures up. And it's me talking to a blank screen and it's very, very intimidating for me. Um, and so the, the um, person who gave this conference had us all go get something that was right around us and, you know, hold up this item to introduce yourself. And so what it did was it really compelled the, everybody on the Zoom to have their camera on. You had to turn your camera on, right? You had to unmute yourself. So we knew you knew how to do it. <laughs> so my, my um, daughter went through one like that. They had her take, I have to ask her what something fun, something that you have since you were a little kid, something, what, what was it that you, were asked to do uh, and and it was a ball they all had a ball and and yeah. it seemed to break the ice that's a good one i probably i'm going to teach the class a second you know for second summer term um even though it's a completely online class i'm going to require students to attend at least three times for a grade um, my zoom office hours i'll put out a um you know i'll do i'll have something that's an alternative exercise for people who you know, can't come any other time besides three o'clock in the morning, but, um, you know, they're <laughs> going to have to write some stuff for me. Um, I'm going to require people to come at least three times for a grade and interact um, so that I, I get some more um, interaction with students. I don't know how that will work, but it's, 
it's my most recent idea. I like that idea. Chris, I, I can uh, see you're thinking. <laughs> no, I'm thinking because I have like 80 students signed up. I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that. But um, I, um, I tried a couple things that I think work. I feel like they just want connection a little bit, and that's what I'm missing too. And so I'm trying to bring in small, really low stakes, kind of fun assignments to start sections off where they can put a little bit of their personality out there and interact with other people. You know, the very, fir the very first two, one was you need to update your profile picture if it's not you, something that you want to represent you. So one student chose a guinea pig and stuff like that. And it, it's, it seems little, but it really helps me because now I know Jay is the guinea pig and he's a great guy. And I saw his picture on respondents and I don't know why he didn't put his face up because it was lovely, but he didn't, you know, he wanted a guinea pig, but I know that I, mean, I would put my dog who's literally jumping up on the table next to me. But, um, you know, so I did that, seriously, it's the easy stuff. So, um, so I did that, but another one was talk to family members and find out how they use chemistry in their everyday life and post those three different ways out there. And then comment on one that was similar and one that was different. And a lot of times I do that for the required as part of it, a comment where they have to comment on one that's similar to theirs and different. So they're understanding who in the class is seeing things like them, but also really noticing how people think and behave differently than them. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I'm trying to do that. And that seems to, you know, I've even had them listen to podcasts and like about Albert Einstein's life and then comment on what in his life can you relate to. And it's really interesting because he had a really zigzag career trajectory, you know. So, um, I, so I'm trying things like that. Um, obviously, the content is still the major focus, but just something to get the community has been very, very important. Thanks, Chris. Okay, um, David um, or Molly, can you tell me how um, the stuff in the chat gets shared, copied, saved? Uh, it can be. Um, it doesn't normally. Uh, usually, if we add a link, we want you to click on it and then it's open in a window and you can bookmark it. Uh, however, I can uh, go through the chat and make a little summation of all the links and email it to everyone in attendance. Thanks, that would be great. And then um, I'm just gonna say I, I, I am available. Um, I just, you know, to, as you set up your Canvas pages, as you start to think about um, the simulations, again, if you're an, an adjunct instructor, follow your lead instructor. They've got probably the labs set up. But if you're trying to figure out how to integrate things, um, don't hesitate. You can call me. My number's, um, it's, it's in the directory. This has been a really nice thing. It, it rings to my cell phone. So that's really nice. But it's 488-4051. Don't hesitate to call me or email me. And I, I like it's so much easier for me to just tell you, oh, look, this go to this link in Canvas and I can get you where you want to go than you spending hours trying to figure it out. I really appreciate you all being here today. Um, it, again, I, I hope that um, it, the, um, our time together gave you a little bit of, of um, insight into providing labs online, but I think the other thing is I really hope that you see that it's it's a fun thing. And I, I think it's been great to learn all of this stuff. Um, and, and I hope that you'll find that um, it can be a rewarding experience, right? It's just rewarding in a different way. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for being here though. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I appreciate you working with the Faculty Success Center to put this on, sharing your experience and wisdom, and I, uh, I appreciate you very much. Thanks, David. Thanks for being here. You guys, um, David and Molly, uh, keep everything running. Um, they, they are our go-to people. They're golden. So we um, are just so grateful.
And I'm glad that you even thought about presenting this, David. I didn't even, it wasn't even on my radar screen. So thanks so much. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm sure I'll be calling you. Do that, Kathy. I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll remember that. Thanks. Good to see you. Appreciate faculty like you just as much. Thanks, Molly. Bye, guys.